because their mother or father was convicted of an offense. Some offense uh, are not that severe or serious enough to warrant destroying the bond between the mother and the child. That bond is paramount and should be respected. And not to deny kids the right to love, hug, kiss, and squeeze their mother or father because they broke the law is uh, taking this law thing a little too far. And you want to know about the violence in the street, why kids are being disrespectful and, and cutting up. You don't take a mother out of a kid's life or the father if you can help it. So uh, that was one of the po topics we'll talk about. We'll get into part of that a little later. But we have, we have been joined this morning by Ray Ann Nickens, uh, the founder and president of the Trayron Center. But before we get to Miss Nickens, we always go with what we call the grapevine. The grapevine is the information that you can use. Well, that's the grapevine. Here's something that's interesting. Airspace restricted above 33 additional Bureau of Prison facilities. FAA restricts drone flights up to 400 feet over BOP sites. Effective uh, February of this year, the FAA has restricted drone flights, flights up to 400 feet over 33 additional BOP facilities. I mean, it's 53. These sites are in addition to the 20 BOP facilities already protected as of July 2018. These protections are a result of the continued efforts of the BOP, the Borough of Prisons, and the Department of Justice to justify the security threat posed by drones. Drone operators who violate the flight restrictions may be subject to civil and or criminal uh, proceedings. The BOP continues to face security threats posed by the use of drones, including for the purpose of introducing contraband, narcotics, cell phones, SIM cards, etc inside secure facilities. The FAA flight restrictions are part of the BOP's ongoing efforts to maintain safe and secure facilities and protect inmates from the, uh, and their families. At Juvie from Hell, guards get the okay to pepper, pepper spray kids in New York City. Things have gotten so out of hand at the New York City's Bronx Juvenile Detention Center that the state has given correctional officers there special permission to blast dangerous inmates with pepper spray. The state has granted very limited use of spray at Horizon Juvenile Center uh, from using a disabling irritant on rowdy inmates, but with 40 correction officers injured by inmates in there since last Monday, the state issued a one-week reprieve. Starting Wednesday, the guards can pepper spray troublesome inmates whose names have been added to a state-approved list of bad apples. To get on the naughty list, inmates must have been involved in two prior incidents or one prior incident that resulted in the serious injury of another official said. Likewise, guards cannot fire pepper spray at inmates who have a mental illness or who are allergic to the active ingredients inside of the pepper spray. The city finished transferring all 16 and 17-year-old youth off of Rackers Island and into Horizon in October. And since then, there's been violent incidents at the center nearly every day. The court ordered Nunez, Nunez monitoring team, which was created to monitor use of force on Rackers Island, actually recommended opening Horizon with pepper spray on hand and facing out later. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. The First Step Act comes up short in Trump's 2020 budget. Supporters worry about law, seeks $75 million a year for five years, but, but President Trump's plan lists only $14 million. When groups that lobby for federal prison reform found there was no money in the budget this year for the First Step Act, many gave Congress and the White House for pass. <clears throat> they focus instead on next year's funding for the new law, which includes more prison education and job training programs. But on Monday, their good faith was put to the test as President Trump released his budget priorities for 2020. Only 14 million was explicitly listed to finance the act's program. Congress passed the First Step Act in late December, 
well into the 2019 budget. A day after the president signed the law, the federal government launched, lurched into a month-long shutdown, delaying preparation to meet the law's requirements. Money for the law's course could be set aside by the Department of Justice, but it was awaiting the confirmation of a new attorney general. That, that didn't happen until last month when William Barr was confirmed. Congress made its commitment to public safety clear when it passed the First Step Act. We now, urge you to, we now urge you to provide the full amount of funding. With all of the groups across the country that were in support of the First Step Act and how they was praised and patting each other on the back about there going to be some changes in the prison system across the country, that was some more jiggy boogie. Here we go, the money is not even available in the budget and all the backpacking and hand slapping is all for naught. Well, the change is coming down to benefit and to help our men and women who are incarcerated. Boy, this jug and boogie don't seem to stop. <laughs> Lastly, Alabama prison warden lacks authority to make end-of-life decisions for prisoners. The 11th Circuit Court of Appeals held that an Alabama prison warden was not entitled to qualified immunity because his actions of requesting a do not resuscitate order and decision to remove a prisoner from life support did not fall within the scope of his discretionary authority. Warden Carter Davenport included an instruction with Cummins paperwork. Cummins, his name is Marquette Cummins Jr., the inmate was stabbed in the eye. Uh, and he was suffering from serious illness and was in his order, maybe was in serious injury. Uh, sometimes later, Davenport ordered that Cummins be removed from life support which resulted in his death at the hospital in January of 2014. The appeal court noted that the Alabama Natural Death Act compels the conclusion that the office of a prison warden gives him no authority to enter a do not resuscitate order or to order the withdrawal of artificial life support on behalf of a dying inmate. Whew, and that's been the grapevine, information that's been used from around the country. Thank you for listening. Now we get to our topic for this morning, children impacted by gun violence. And joining us is Ray Ann B. Nickens, founder and president of the Trey Ron Center. Good morning, Miss Nickens. Good morning. Thank you for having me. And thank you for coming. We're just meeting you for the first time. Right. Usually most guests we have, we've heard about them, know about them, or seen them, or whatever. How long have you been on the scene doing what you're doing? So I started um, as a student, divinity student at Howard University School of Divinity, and my last year working with um, families who have been impacted by gun violence, mm -hmm. um, just assembling them to see what we could do in an effort to bring about some policy changes uh, in, in our city. Uh, and then, and so I worked with another organization called Washington Interfaith Network. And we would have what we call house meetings to talk about the issue and see how do we go forward with those who are directly impacted um, making the decisions. And uh, in those 90 minute meetings, we would just do what I think, what I call, you know, people bleeding all over you because wow. they were telling their stories and it didn't matter if their child, their uncle, their relative was killed um, a couple of days before that meeting or 20 years ago, the pain was still there. And that pain was real because in the black community, we don't always deal with our mental health. Um, and trauma is a part of mental health because with that knock at the door, that phone call saying that someone has intentionally taken the life of your loved one, uh, it throws your life into disarray. There are all kinds of emotions that come with it. And when they're undealt with, it causes other kinds of things to happen. And so um, I, as a student, you know, I thought I was gonna get a nice little church, do some social justice work. <laughs> <laughs> and and, 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 and just, just be a nice little yeah, preacher and go there. Else, <laughs> right, and so, um, when that didn't happen, you know, I'm like, what am I supposed to do in here was um, this issue of gun violence that had impacted my life um, as a teen growing up in How has it impacted your life? So my uncle David was killed in 1989. He was walking um, from my grandmother's house to my aunt's house. 
Uh, my aunt lived on 42nd Street in Southeast, and he was shot twice mm -hmm. um, and left to die. Uh, and then a couple of years before our family could really deal with the death of my uncle, um, on December the 3rd, 1993, uh, our next door neighbor and my sister got into an argument that escalated into him shooting my pregnant sister and killing mm. her, shooting my mother, my brother, and another sister. Um, my mother threw, she did that thing that mothers do, she threw her body on him to stop him from shooting her children. Mm -hmm. um, and ended up, they were rushing for the gun and ended up ending his life. Um, but as did your I, mother make out? She's still alive and she's, you know, still she going through. Also? Yes, she was shot twice. Um, the bullet grazed her head and, and then another bullet hit her in the leg. Mm -hmm. And so, and she's had problems, health problems as a result of that. Um, and But there's the also the mental the emotional and mental stress, stresses of um, seeing someone shoot your children. Mm -hmm. You know, someone that you trusted, that you knew, uh, shoot your children down. But they, as I grew and I understood um, some issues around social justice and became more aware, the person who did this had, had been home for a year. He had um, come home, he had gotten a job, he had come home from prison, you know, and try, you know, that rehabilitation mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. uh, when they found out that he was a felon, he was fired. Mm. And so when you have no other place to go, yeah. you go back to what you know. And he went yeah. back to drugs and alcohol. And so that night, um, he was high, he was drunk, and you have an eight months pregnant hormonal woman, and it was just the perfect storm for two people who talked, um, who we set out when it was hot, grilled hot sauce and things, two families that mm -hmm. have been engaged, otherwise friendly, mm -hmm. you know, one night because of a person's down on their luck um, and have, you know, didn't have anywhere else to turn and it turned deadly. So the Trayron Center, and then a couple of years after my sister, my family was attacked, my brother was killed. Mm. As well. So how many that make of your family was killed? Three. 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 Um, and so it was just like you know, um, what do you do? And so it, the Trayron Center. Uh, a lot of people ask, how did I come up with the name? Uh, it is the first three letters of my brother and my sister's name, Tracy and Ronnie, mm -hmm. and it is my living memorial to them mm -hmm. to help other people. Uh, deal with their pain. And your sister was pregnant when she was shot? Yes, she, she was, was eight killed? months pregnant. Mm -hmm. And did the baby survive? No. Um, no. Um, you know, and so I remember that after my sister was killed, 22 days after my sister was killed, I was 15, was the first time I tried to commit suicide. Mm. Um, I went through most of my um, teen years and young adult years severely depressed. Why did you want to commit suicide? I felt like there was nothing left. Um, it just, for me, my sister was my protector. I grew up in a big, a large family, seven other siblings. Um, she was my protector. She mm -hmm. was that person for me that made everything okay. Um, and then I existed as if everybody died that night. Mm. I understand. Um, and you know when your brain because a lot of a lot of research is now showing that our brains are still developing and we're still dealing you know growing emotionally and mentally and when you suffer trauma at an early age um our brain does this poo-poo thing mm -hmm. of, of processing that pain and um so i just kind of checked out but the weird thing is I checked out on the emotional and the mental part of life. I didn't check out on the educational part of life. I was a good student. Mm -hmm. um, somehow I became this rock star student. Mm -hmm. uh, went in science fairs, city-wide wow. science wow. fairs and things. And, and just kind of so you're channeling all your hurt into education. Right. Yeah. And I had vowed that um, I was going to college. Um, I was getting the heck out of D.C. and I was never going to return to the city. And I did. I went on to North Carolina Central University. 
uh, to receive a bachelor's degree in communications and a minor in writing, because that was going to be the Oprah Winfrey of course reporter, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and so I was going to be this oh. rock star. Um, but, you know, my senior year at North Carolina, I felt God calling me back home. Um, and I am a woman of faith. And so at that point, I was like, heck no. And I was still, I had a professor who was pushing me um, into an internship with ESPN and he was helping me get to where I wanted to go. But the call to come back to DC was um, greater than uh, the call to be the Open Web for your sports yeah. reporting. <laughs> um, and, and so uh, that's, that's the background of how um, the Trey Ron the Center Chance started. When you had home. these meetings, you say many, many meetings uh, with children impacted by gun violence. Those were for the, the parents and family members. All right, so somebody um, who was, was, who who was, was killed, killed or okay. wounded. Mm -hmm. What are some of the youngest kids that you've had in these, in these meetings? How young are them kids? Uh, so three. Three years old? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can they articulate or express what happened or? They can. They? they they absolutely can articulate what happened. Um, one, uh, so let me Go ahead. take a step back. Uh, why I intentionally focused on children was in one of the meetings, um, a grandmother brought her grandson who was the only child of her son who was killed two oh, years ago. Um, he, her son, the, the son or the father? Uh, the son. The son was seven. Seven. And it happened two weeks ago? No, two years ago. Two years ago. Yeah, his father um, was taken two years ago. And he said in that meeting, um, when I grow up, I'm going to get a gun and I'm going to kill the man who killed my dad. Oh. Wow. He was seven years old. He was seven, right? Mm -hmm. So he's already thinking about retaliation at seven, and he's not, he wasn't getting any help to deal with that pain yeah. Of, yeah. of losing for what his grandmother described his best friend. He wasn't just dad. He was his best friend. Mm -hmm. He was always with his dad. His dad was his primary caregiver, mm -hmm. um, and now that's gone, and here he is articulating his pain, but... You know, it's brushed off because he's seven and he really doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. But he does know what he's talking about. He's telling, you know, those adults around him, I'm hurting and I need you all to see my pain. And so I'll work. That's when I realized that, you know, for the most vulnerable in our community affected by gun violence, our children in elementary school, we're not hearing them. And they're not getting the help. And by the time they become teenagers and young adults, we're reacting to sure. everything. Yeah. Yeah. We're now in a reaction mode, and we've got to throw all this money into programs to help them. And we're not, and those programs aren't really dealing with the trauma of what they experience. Can you, can you uh, identify one or two things that you see in all kids who have lost a loved one mm -hmm. or a parent killed by violence? I know anger is always one of the things. Right. But what is it that you do uh, with the Trayron Center to address the, the need of these kids who've lost a family member or loved one through gun violence? So, and, and it's even living in a community that suffered gun violence. Mm -hmm. Because we leave that part out. They might not be directly impacted by gun violence and having lost a relative, but they may be in a community that is heavily impacted by gun violence, and that also um, brings up emotions and fears in them. Um, so we use art therapy as a tool to help our kids facilitate what do you mean their art pain. Therapy? Explain what so you mean. art therapy can be anywhere from um, one day the kids were asked to draw um, a face of that resembled how they felt about themselves. Um, and then they were asked to draw a face of how they felt about their community. Most of the faces about themselves were colorful or bright mm -hmm. colors and things. The face of their community was red and black, mm -hmm. dark, dark colors. And so what that allows us to do is facilitate a conversation, start a conversation with the kids. Art therapy is just them drawing or coming up with a creative something yeah. or another. Uh -huh. um, 
and then we talking through it then the facilitator or the therapist talking through um, what it is and so and our kids talk they express themselves. Do they do any? Do y'all do any role modeling when the kids act out what they witness or what they experience? No, we have not gone that far because we. Um, I've been at this work with kids since um, the summer of twenty eighteen. Wow, you just started. Yeah, we just started, and um, our kids are at a place where they are. We, we're now, it takes a while to develop trust with them. Um, and so it's this process of constantly changing. How many kids do you work with? We work with 25 kids and um, we embed ourselves into communities. Mm -hmm. We. What does that mean? You that means that we are in the community center and that community, like we are in Langston Lane mm -hmm. apartments. They have a community room. Right. Um, so we're there five days a week. Working is with that the about children. a Hartfield Center? Is a building called the Hartfield Center on Maryland Avenue, 21st and Maryland Avenue? Is that no, no. So, um, Langston Lane Apartments, you're thinking probably overall from Maryland Avenue. Yeah, yeah, no. Okay. We are in, it's like a block away from 7th District Police Station okay, in South Bend. Yeah, right, right. Woodland, right, the Woodland area. Yes, okay. um, that's where we are. So, we embed ourselves, so embedding ourselves into communities allows us to know what the community is going through, how many times and how often the kids are experiencing um, gunshots. Um, so you're witness or experiencing any gunshots and why y'all were having these meetings with yes. the kids? Just so, a couple of weeks ago. So you're sitting in a room dealing with gun violence for kids, mm -hmm. the impact on kids, and you're hearing gunshots outside. How does that affect the kids that's inside of the group? So our kids, that gives our kids go back and it gives us an opportunity to talk with them, to see them when it happens. And their kids, our kids are from three years old wow. to 13. And kids have a funny way of reacting. Some of them are scared. Some of them, when our nerves pop up, um, they laugh. Like it's a wide range yeah. of emotions coming out. But once we've calmed down and we know that we're safe, we get into what we call our affirmation circles. Mm -hmm. And we have that safe and sacred space for them to talk about their pain and talk about what they had just experienced. And for some of our older kids, they are like, it's normal now, Ms. Lyon. Or mm -hmm. if I- any of them kids come in with weapons or knives yeah. in some of the groups? No, they don't. But they, but a couple of my kids have come in with bullets they found on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, as show and tell, I take them. Um, but no, they they understand what guns and knives do. That they are not good things. Do you receive funding from any anywhere to help you to run this program? So we have been blessed in that the faith community in Washington D.C has been absolutely amazing. Um, we started in November of 2017. Mm -hmm. We are, like you said, a new organization. Um, and so the faith community has been completely amazing in helping us raise wow. money. Oh. They have held fundraisers. They have provided re people resources for us, provided space. Um, so they have been amazing in doing those things. We um, is have- Is the city government helping you out in any way? No, so no. So it is, funds from the city? We have not yet, but we are looking into it because what happens with organizations like ours that are new, um, many grants are data driven. Yeah. We just started. Yes, I see. We, we just yeah. started, so we don't necessarily have all you know, the data that proves what we do works. And the reality is we won't really know if we are having an impact until our kids get into a situation. Yeah, so um, become grown. And grown, yeah. that we've made an impact. Uh, so, you know, funding is tricky, but we have, um, NPR did an article on us a couple of weeks ago, 
Uh, we've been blessed that Politico did an article on us a year ago. Um, How many staff did you have working with you? We have one, me, and a group of volunteers that are awesome. We have volunteers from Howard University. College um, students? Yes. Yes, they have taken, they've fallen in love with our kids. We have a group of clinicians that um, volunteer their time. Uh, and just people who care about the issue of gun violence, mental health, and education. Mm -hmm. uh, because those are the three things that the Trayvon Center addresses. I'd like to suggest that there's a guy named Barry Lenore, the director of uh, United Black Fund over in Southeast. Uh, uh, you can give him a call when we get finished. I can give you his number. Mm -hmm. He made this possible funding. Also, something like this, of this magnitude, uh, the faith-based community, I'm glad you said that they've been coming on board and helping out. With every church in the city, synagogue, uh, temple, mm -hmm. etc., they all have a prison ministry. In your program, uh, children impacted by gun violence is something that should be a part of all, every faith-based organization in the city. But we're talking about uh, tomorrow when our kids are impacted, right. even though they witnessed or experienced or felt the loss of a loved one, that pain, as you said, when a seven-year-old, he's going to kill this guy who killed his father. Mm -hmm. And kids hold that anger for a long time. And the problem we're having now uh, the story I read at the top of the show about these kids up in New York City at the Horizon Juvenile Center in Bronx, mm -hmm. that these kids are fighting every day, 40 correction officers staffed and injured inside the juvenile facility. And these kids got so much hurt, so much anger, so much pain, and they don't have no way of getting this stuff out creatively or productively. Right. And what you're doing, I'm, I think that the church community, the faith-based community should get involved with this wholeheartedly. Uh, do you know a brother named Tyrone Parker with the Alliance of Concerned Men? I don't, but I know Beverly Smith who works with him. They're doing something similar. Uh, Y'all have some synergy mm -hmm. in that he does a shock trauma unit. When somebody gets killed or shot, right. him and his crew go right in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Immediately, sometimes the gun smoke is still in the air when they, when they come on the scene. Mm -hmm. In your project, it seems like it goes hand in hand because after this all clear out, the kids are still left there. Right. And they don't know where to go or who to turn to. Mm -hmm. And no services. You hear about it every week. Uh, Parkland, the other day, uh, two young kids from Parkland right. shooting got killed or committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And one of the fathers and one of the other little kids mm -hmm. committed suicide. Sandy Hook. Yeah, Sandy mm -hmm. Hook. And there's no way of uh, addressing this. So we'll take a break and be right back. Uh, if you want to call in and talk to our guest, Ray Ann Nickens, founder and president of the Trayron Center, the number to call is 202. 588-0893. That's 202-588-0893. We're talking about gun violence impacted by our youth, but we're talking about our mamas, because mamas bring these kids in the world. We'll take our break and be right back. Playing that because the Sean was we talking about going to the prisons. Mm -hmm. See, uh, take kids to reconnect with their mothers. Well, I ask you that question when we get back. Do you do uh, is there any kind of programs dealing with this young violence? It takes this. This pain is on so level. I'll wait till we. You very. Intelligent young young lady, you want my job here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I got the student loans <laughs> to prove that there has been some education. <laughs> there has been. Y'all did the movie. Yeah. There has been some kind of education. So Lashawn got an hour ten. And we're talking about. I always love my mama. The topic of the show is children impacted by gun violence. We had a young lady scheduled to come in from the wire, but because of other commitments or the traffic, she wasn't able to get in. So we're talking to Ray Ann Nickens, founder and president of the Trayron Center, a program that's dealing with children impacted by gun violence. And we played this song, I Always Love My Mama. That was part of this conversation because we're talking about her program, Children Impacted by Gun Violence. And the question is, when a kid is in the street and the father's in prison and the mother may be in prison and they witness gun violence and they already lost the mother and the father or one mm -hmm. or the other, 
do you take kids inside of institutions to connect with their parents or loved ones or somebody? Uh, say a kid's brother or sister may got killed and the mother's in jail mm -hmm. or the father's in jail. Does your program have that kind of option to take the kids to visit their parent or the loved one who's incarcerated of the deceased victim? So for us, the kids that we currently serve, they have both parents um, in their lives. Okay. Um, and that are active in their life. So we don't, but that is something that Lashawnee and I, uh, who you mentioned from The Wire, we mm -hmm. met about a year or so ago and just kind of instantly gravitated toward each other uh, because we both, um, the funny thing is, we grew up kind of in the same neighborhood. But you didn't know each other. Didn't know each other. We had um, different stories. She grew up in a, um, certain kind of a home and then I grew up in another kind of home I tell people that I am not the product of a single mother because my father even though they were they split up my dad for the 40 years I've been on this earth has never been far from me hmm. um, so awesome. I don't I didn't grow up in a single home my dad just lived in a different home mm -hmm. he's always been there and been consistent as a father and as a dad um, and so here we are just four years apart in age um, and she's had this whole life experience where she didn't always feel protected and here I was feeling overwhelmingly protected mm -hmm. a little bit too much at times um, and she went on to you know violence was mm -hmm. a part of her lifestyle as a for a while that ended her up in jail, ended up in incarceration mm -hmm. for her on murder charges. And while she was in, in jail, I was in college, you know, okay. uh, North Carolina Central University, uh, and then Howard University. Mm -hmm. And so uh, here to life, and now we are together, course, yeah. crossing roads, and that synergy you talked about with, um, with, uh, the Alliance of Concerned Concerned Man, yeah. Concerned Man. Um, that is something that Lashani and I can explore. Please do, that because yes, we can. They go hand in hand right. with what y'all doing, because uh, that is. Uh, we got two calls, a couple of calls on the line right now. We'll take the first caller. Our first caller, uh, you're on the air. Question or comment, please. Yes, it's you. It's you. <laughs> if you were you, you were you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and that means a lot to me. Thank you. Yeah. And Merry Christmas to you, lady. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Our next caller, please. You on the air. Question or comment? Hey. I knew you'd be calling in, you turkey. <laughs> there you go. Come on with it, Cedric. Big smooth. He's a valuable contact because he works with the lines to work with him. Man, and anybody that, that you see, uh, uh, said Al Malik or whatever. We're talking about our kids, man, and I just, it dawned on me that this is a, s a segment that's being ignored. They weren't shot, but they've been shot 
emotionally, psychologically, and internally. Yeah. And they're bleeding yeah. just as hard inside. And yeah, I just went through a couple of funerals uh, 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 a few weeks ago. This friend of mine is uh, worked over there with us at the shelter. Her son was shot and killed with Sam. Mm -hmm. Hold on a minute, Sam. She is going to get her number, and I'm glad you said that. You can share this with Al Malik and all the other guys yeah. on the front line. Uh, I know you will, you turkey. You always do. Uh, Thank you. You want to give your, uh, your number, please? So you can reach us by our either our website, www.treyroncenter.org. Uh, Treyron is spelled T-R-A-R-O-N-C-E-N-T-E-R. Or by emailing me at r y a n e at treyroncenter dot org. Okay, thank you. We got a couple more calls on the line. The next caller, please. You're on the air. Hello. Uh, yes. Good morning, Mr. Brown. How you doing? Good morning. Good morning, Mrs. Brown. How you doing? <laughs> Great. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you. And he mentioned a group called EFFECT. That means efforts for ex-convict. EFFECT has been in business over 35 years at least. And for 32 or 33 years, they were the only returning citizen ex-offender organization that ran a halfway house successfully for 32 years in Washington, D.C. And as our last caller just mentioned, the returning citizens or credible messengers, DYRS, the Department of Youth Rehabilitative Services, have a program with uh, 20 or 30 returning citizens where I act as mentors. So when the show is over, we like to plug you into some of these other folk. Because okay. later, because what you're doing is valuable. And I see kids all the time sitting on this curb on the sidewalk mm -hmm. with a faraway, depressed looking eye. Mm -hmm. They done lost their mother, their father. They are alone there on the street and they witness this violence. And they're going to re uh, respond accordingly the same way. Right. So we got to save our kids. <laughs> we got another caller on. We'll take this last caller. Uh, you on the air, please. Question or comment for Miss Nickens. Hi, Mother Well, hello there, lady. I was looking, I was looking, expecting to see you sitting right across from me this morning. <laughs> That be? Give me the information, the date and the time. Yeah. 
And where is Chuck it located? Right down from the big chair. Right from the big chair. Yes, okay. Okay. Thank you for what you do, LaShawn yeah. uh, Thompson. I mean, lady, you you blew my mind when you came out. You did eight, 18 to 20, you came out, mm -hmm. and you started a group called The Y, and you working, and you did this little film, The Returning yeah. Citizens. But beyond that, lady, you uh, wrote, you rolled up your sleeves, you involved, yeah. Yeah. and we're talking about children impacted by gun violence. I like to throw in that out, saying ch children impacted by incarceration. Exactly. Their parents, are, it's the same kind of pain when you lose someone. <laughs> So, lady, you, you hooked in with LaShawna, mm -hmm. Tyrone, we got Cedric yeah. called in. You got some folk who are on the front line working. And when any time anybody's dealing with our kids, we on board, my wife and I. I don't care what it is. We're talking mm -hmm. about saving our tomorrows. And uh, yeah. we originally thought LaShawna, when we did the show, we were going to talk about going to the program about taking uh, kids to reconnect with their mothers mm -hmm. inside of institutions, because that is really... It just hurts. Well, uh, we grew up at dinner once or every now and then, my wife and I. We see so many kids sitting there on steps or on stoops. Like, and I can, I know the feeling. They're waiting for their daddy to come by, and dad don't show. And you see them with their hand on their, on their face, and they look so sad and depressed. Or they've seen somebody get killed, and there's nowhere to go. There's no rec centers, or there's a rec center. There's no therapist. There's no clinicians there mm -hmm. to redirect this energy or this pain. Folk, we got, oh, yeah, let me just throw this in before we get out of here. Trump said he can put five billion dollars for the wall. That five billion can save our kids, man. Yep. If you take five billion dollars and put a half a billion, a half a billion in the ten black communities where there's most crime violence or gun violence, mm -hmm. and we can stop the violence, we got a crisis in our community, not at the border. The crisis of us killing each other, the cops killing us, and kids are being mm -hmm. the victims. So that five billion dollars, sir, could go a long ways to stop the killing, to fund uh, Ray Ann's program and programs like that, and with LaShawna and Andrea mm -hmm. James. They got women doing things right now who've never been involved on the front line because of the stigma of being locked up and you're a female and you're a mother. And I'm glad that you came out and you're doing what you're doing, uh, LaShawna, that stop worrying about the stigma or the image. That mm -hmm. Save lives. You're reaching people. You're touching people. And young lady, we'll take this last call. Then we let you wrap up, uh, Ray on. Our next caller, you on the air, please. Question or comment? Hey, Rick, where you been at, you turkey? <laughs> okay. Yes. Good question. Good question, Rick. Thank you. So, um, one of our kids, well, two of our kids, are they're experiencing homelessness. They're couch surfing with their mom right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so... And they're we, afraid to go back in the home or the neighborhood? Well, they're not afraid. They just don't have a home. Mm -hmm. They have, they just don't. When the mom and her girlfriend is having issues, and our kids, they, they do that. But on a larger scale, when families have to be relocated, because a loved one was shot or or killed, and then there's testimony, you know, the trial mm -hmm. and different things. Um, that throws one. Folks don't have money. Most of these communities, the unemployment rate is over eighty percent. Yes. Right. So where are you going? You don't have that reserve fund to come mm -hmm. pick up and move your family. Mm -hmm. You can't even afford to stay where you're at. Right. You can't. And then. Um, 
the subpar housing that that we know mm -hmm. they already live in play a part too. Environment plays a large part yes. in our in our emotional and mental health. And so when you live in a crappy complex mm -hmm. that's yeah. not taken care of, and then you have the violence on top of that. And unemployment, and, we, drugs. and unemployment and everything else. And we know that DC is being gentrified in such a way that we're being pushed out and that you just can't afford to live in the city. And it's coming east of the river. It hasn't really gotten to east of the river just yet. It's taking hold. But it's, it's on coming. the way. It's five it's years coming. out. We'll see it. They'll start in Bird Palm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll yeah, start they there. But, but it plays a huge part. So this isn't just a one issue thing of gun violence. This is education. Yes. This is job and employment. Well, well, this is housing. Thing. It's everything Definitely. is encompassing. If you go and you talk to a person who's committed um, gun violence and you say, what happened to you? You don't say, why did you do it? What happened to you? They got you to this place. Steve, we got a couple minutes. You want to give a, uh, a closing and let folks know what they can do if they want to help out in the number of getting to contact you? All right. So we are always welcome to volunteers. Um, but because we deal with children, you do have to pass a security a background check mm -hmm. um, because my overarching goal is to keep our babies safe. safe. Yes. Um, and I am very much anti-violence, but if you hurt one of my babies, you've got a lot, of, <laughs> okay. got a bit, a lot to deal with, but I am very much peaceful. Um, this issue, the more we can bring attention to the most vulnerable of our children, our babies, that are three to 13 years of age. Who can you give the phone be? number, people, can your phone number oh, again, please? Uh -huh. So you can reach us um, at info at treyroncenter.org or ryan at treyroncenter.org or you can go to our website at www.treyroncenter.org. Okay, our guest has been Ryan B. Nickens, founder and president of the Treyron Center a program uh, designed to work with children impacted by gun violence. And it's a need, everything we have in our community is a need. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's sad to see that we have to fight. We die a thousand deaths before we die. Yeah. Everything that you can touch from pencils, ink pens, coats, farmers, whatever, yeah. we as minorities have to fight for every scrap, every, every inch. Level. <laughs> and we're talking about our kids. And this is something that is sacred. And all kids uh, deserve to be connected with their mother and their parents. But when yeah. somebody, kid, uh, is impacted by this kind of violence, I'm 75, and I remember some things that happened when I was 8, 9, or 10 years old that were very mm -hmm. violent and traumatic, and I haven't forgotten them yet. And yeah. I don't know how many ways that it impacted me, affected me, but it has. Mm -hmm. So, folks, this is uh, one of them topics that we like for you to you listen to it, call somebody, do something. Don't just sit on the couch, man, and say, oh, that was an interesting show. It ain't about being interesting. It's about saving some lives and reaching some kids and turning some folks around because that kid may be your kid later. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know, man. So we need your help to keep these kind of things going. Mm -hmm. And Lashana, thank you for introducing us to this lady named Ray Ann B. Nicky. <laughs> lady, you something else. Oh. Thank you for your commitment, your passion. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, one other question before we go. What can anybody do who's listening? If they see a kid who's been experienced mm -hmm. violence, what can they do to help that particular kid? It's so simple, but it's love them. Love them. Mm -hmm. Love them. They may express anger and what we call bad kids. Just love them. Ain't no bad kids. They yeah, just won't get hurt. Yep, yeah. they won't get in their hurt and all they're looking for it's yep. consistent, authentic love. Yes. Right. You know, this is, uh, uh, I want to thank you for joining us, lady, and we'll have you back. And I'd like mm -hmm. for you to invite my wife and I over to your place so we can come over more than welcome. and see if we can help out. Because uh, mm -hmm. we love kids, all mm -hmm. kids. And it ain't about color or ethnicity. Mm -hmm. Kids are kids, and we should not separate kids from their parents, mm -hmm. and particularly those kids who have incarcerated parents. Mm -hmm. That hurt is deep in our heart when you see a little kid go to the visit room and in the feds and some prisons 
you're allowed, some children, you're allowed 15 seconds to hug your mother or 15 mm -hmm. seconds to kiss at the beginning and at the end. And you sit there for two, three hours and the kid ain't seen their mother in a couple of years. And they want to crawl on their mom, on their daddy. Mm -hmm. And you can't. And if you do, the bill visit is terminated. For punishment, you sit to jail as punishment, not to go to jail and be punished. You don't need, you, you're not supposed to punish the families and the kids because the parent committed a crime or broke the law. That's unhuman. And you don't destroy that bond between a mother and a kid. That's why we had this song, I Always Love My Mama. Mm -hmm. And we're and glad that you came in and talked about impacted, kids impacted by drugs. Please, I'd like for you to contact, but we give you the numbers, uh, mm -hmm. Tyrone Parker with that shock trauma unit in, in the community. He called a big old guy named Smooth. He's we were working with kids for years, settling them. You got quite a few people, lady, who's in the community who is willing to help you to, and, 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 and participate. But we need funding. So you rascals yeah. who work in the government or you rascals who get to somebody who make decisions, this lady needs money to run this program to save our kids' lives. It ain't about a car or a house. Mm -hmm. It's about lives. And uh, we need your help to support the Trayron Center. Uh, you can call her or you can call us. Oh, yeah. And somebody told me the other day, me and my wife, that I sound like I'm a fat man on the air. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a fat man, buddy. I weigh 180 and 5'9", uh, and I'm not fat, but I'm fat in love. I'm fat in understanding, man, and I'm fat in giving. And I'm fat in dealing with jokers like you to say, hey, we need to come together to help our community. So we're fat in helping our community. And we keep on being a fat man that way. I ain't fat in waist size. I'm just fat in ideas and love. I so, can affirm he's not fat. <laughs> she, 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 she's looking at me. She knows I'm not fat. So, uh, and also, last Saturday at the Blacks and Wax uh, at the Kennedy Center was formed by uh, yes. this core master bird, the late mayor, uh, Marion Bird's wife, has been putting this on for several years. And them kids performed mm -hmm. at the Kennedy Center to standing, standing room only crowd. And it was mm -hmm. fantastic and phenomenal. So support the mm -hmm. Southeast Tennis Learning Center with core masters bird and what they did with the Blacks and Wax. And we'll close with saying goodbye to my beautiful wife, Mertine, mm -hmm. to Shaheen on the community TV, to Mike Red Eagle Masala, our engineer, to Jackie Craig Bay, our social producer, to our guests, and to the folks who call in. And remember, your inner